This is the 10th video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video we will look over biotechnology as well as fermentation. And this is the first video in the final topic of B3 which is biotechnology. In this video we will look over what is meant by biotechnology. We will look at the advantages of using microorganisms for food production. We will look at the need to supply suitable conditions in a fermenter and the effect they have on growth rates. And finally, we will look at the advantages of using mycoprotein as a food source. So what is biotechnology? Biotechnology means that we are using living organisms, especially microorganisms, to produce useful products or to carry out a process, for example, water purification. The bio part of biotechnology means life, and the technology part means that we're using it within industry. In order to use microorganisms to carry out a process, we need to be able to grow them and make them multiply. This is where fermentation comes in. You'll have looked at fermentation previously within B1 and B2. We can carry out a simple fermentation. This is where we take sugar and we add it to yeast. The yeast will respire anaerobically and convert the sugar into ethanol. They will also release carbon dioxide. We can test for this in the lab by setting up two test tubes one which has our sugar, our yeast and our water in, and a second one which has our lime water. We then put a thin layer of oil on the top of the mixture which has the yeast in, in order to force them to respire anaerobically. We then connect the two test tubes together using a bung and a thin tube in order to allow the gas that's being given off by the yeast, the carbon dioxide, to escape out of the first test tube into the second test tube. It will then bubble through the lime water and it will turn it milky. We can then count the bubbles produced over a certain time period to measure the rate of carbon dioxide production. This then allows us to examine the rate of respiration. By using different conditions, for example different pHs or different temperatures, we can look at the effects of these changes on the rate of respiration. So how do these different conditions affect the rate of respiration in yeast? The word equation for this reaction is glucose goes to ethanol and carbon dioxide, and the symbol equation is C6H12O6 goes to 2C2H5OH plus 2CO2. If we increase the concentration of sugar, so the amount of food, then the yeast will reproduce faster, so the number of yeast will go up, which will increase the rate of respiration and therefore the rate of fermentation. The pH has to be just right. Too high or too low a pH will slow down reproduction, so the rate of respiration and the rate of fermentation will decrease. This is because the yeast will become denatured by the high acidic or high alkali conditions. The ethanol that the yeast are producing via anaerobic respiration is toxic to them. So as the concentration of this ethanol increases, the rate of respiration will go down, therefore the rate of fermentation will go down as the yeast are gradually being killed off. Finally, we have temperature. So as the temperature increases, so does the rate of respiration and therefore the rate of fermentation. In fact, yeast reproduces faster when it's warmer and the growth rate doubles for every 10 degrees rise in temperature. However, if it gets too hot, then the yeast will denature and die, and we can see the rate of respiration, so the rate of fermentation, drops very, very quickly. So far, we have looked at simple fermentation, but what about fermentation on an industry scale? In industry, we use a large fermenter. These are fermenters here, and we can see here inside of a fermenter. 
A fermenter is basically a big metal drum or container. It contains a liquid culture medium which contains the microorganisms as well as food and nutrients. This enables the microorganisms to grow and reproduce. The conditions inside the fermenter have to be kept just right in order to make sure that the microorganisms can grow and produce their useful product on a large industry scale. So what conditions are required for this fermentation to take place? Well, we can see that we have got various different things that need to be controlled in order to make sure that they grow correctly. First of all, oxygen is piped in, so we can see the oxygen being added in. This enables the microorganisms to respire aerobically. Obviously, if we were making something which needed anaerobic respiration, we would not have the oxygen. This air that is being pumped in is also aseptic. This means that it is sterilised before it enters. This prevents contamination from other microorganisms. We also need to control the pH. This is done via a pH probe. This ensures that the right pH is available for the microorganisms to grow. This is also true of the temperature. So we will measure the temperature with a thermometer. It needs to be kept just at the right temperature in order to make sure that the growth is at optimum. If it's too cold, the growth rate won't be fast enough. And if it's too hot, the enzymes will be denatured and therefore the growth will stop. A problem that has been faced by industry fermentation is the fact that heat is produced by respiration. Therefore, the fermenters need to be consistently cooled. This is done via the use of a water jacket in which cold water is pumped in and then the warm water is pumped out. We also need to provide food and nutrients. We can see the nutrients being pumped in here. This ensures that the microorganisms can grow as well as respire. They will need carbohydrates, in particular sugars, to be used as an energy source, as well as nitrates to make proteins. We will also add vitamins and minerals. More nutrients can then be pumped in when these nutrients start to run out. Finally, we have stirrers. These ensure that the culture is well mixed and therefore all of the microorganisms get enough oxygen and nutrients. It prevents dead spots from appearing. Dead spots are where not enough nutrients and oxygen are present. We can then tap the product off the bottom of the vat here in order to collect it. Here is an example of an exam question about fermentation. So fermenters are used to grow microorganisms, explain how optimum conditions for the growth of microorganisms are controlled in a fermenter. We need to pause the video at this stage and attempt this six mark question. This question is looking at all of those conditions we just looked at. So we have our water cooling jacket and a temperature probe to maintain this optimum temperature. We have inlet pipes for nutrients, for example, ammonia and nitrates to supply microorganisms with food sources and materials to make proteins. We have our oxygen for aerobic microorganisms or aerobic respiration, and we have carbon dioxide being removed. We have our pH probe, which enables us to check the pH, and we can add alkali to raise the pH or acid to lower the pH. This enables us to maintain this optimum pH. The pH is likely to go more acidic due to the production of carbon dioxide. We have our paddles or our stirrers to evenly distribute these nutrients to ensure oxygen goes all around the mixture and to break up clumps of microorganisms. And finally, we have those aseptic conditions to prevent contamination within the fermenter and reduce competition of other organisms to make sure that we're only getting the product that we want to get. Microorganisms can be used in this way in order to produce food. At the moment, the human population is growing exponentially. So we can see we've got a relatively small population, which has then exploded. This is us at current day at about 7.5 billion people. As such, competition for food is very, very high. Therefore, microorganisms can be used to feed the population.
The first way they can be used is they're very easy to manipulate. This means that they're easy to work with, easy to look after. You just need your fermenter and the right conditions. Secondly, the process can use waste products from other industrial processes. So we get much less wasted. So we can use waste products from agriculture or industry in order to feed the microorganisms. Producing food using microorganisms means that the food production is not affected by the climate. So it's inside, and so this means that we can grow this food anywhere. So parts of Siberia or parts of Africa that have very difficult conditions for growing and producing food. Also, microorganisms grow very quickly. This is very useful for food production as we can produce a lot of food very quickly. So to summarise, our first feature is that they have a fast reproductive rate and rapid growth, so large populations are very easy to grow. We can do this independent of climate, so it can be produced anywhere. They're very small and easy to grow, so they don't take up much space and not much resources. We use products that can be formed from waste products in order to save money. And also, because we're using a biological process, as long as the conditions are controlled, the product should remain the same every time. All of these features come together, and this often means that microorganisms are actually cheaper to use than other methods. This also means that we're starting to use microorganisms more and more in order to produce food. You need to know about two of these methods for your GCSE. The first use of microorganisms you need to know about is the use of mycoprotein. Mycoprotein is used to make meat substitutes for vegetarian meals. In particular, it is the main ingredient in corn. Mycoprotein is produced by the fungus Fusarium, which is grown in fermenters using glucose syrup, which is really, really cheap, as food. The fungus then respires aerobically, so we supply it with oxygen, so we're using aerobic conditions, and then we can collect the fungus in order to make mycoprotein. Mycoprotein has a few health benefits over meat in that it contains more protein and more fibre, whilst containing much less fat than meat does. We can also use fermentation to produce yoghurt. Here, bacteria ferment the milk and change it into the yoghurt. This is because they are converting the lactose into lactic acid. The increased acidity sours the milk, giving the yoghurt its sharp taste. The lactic acid also causes the yoghurt to coagulate or to thicken. The equation for this is lactose going to lactic acid. In order to make yoghurt, we have to go through a few steps. First of all, we will sterilise all of the equipment in order to produce aseptic conditions. Then the milk will be pasteurised, as we looked at in the B3.5 video, and then it is cooled. We then add in our lactobacillus bacteria and the mixture is incubated. We will heat it to about 40 degrees to increase the activity of the bacteria. The bacteria will convert the lactose sugar into lactic acid. The lactic acid, as I mentioned earlier, causes it to clot and coagulate and solidify into the yogurt. We can then add different flavours, for example, different fruit flavours or different colours. Then we can package it up and ship the yoghurt. We can then examine the effect on changing conditions on the activity of the bacteria. For example, we can set up a selection of milk samples, which we will incubate at different temperatures between 20 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius. This will enable us to see how successful the yoghurt production has been as we can measure the change in the pH. This is because as the yoghurt is made, the pH will decrease. This is due to the production of the lactic acid. This means the pH decreases from around pH 7 to pH 4. The reaction then slows down at pH 4 because the bacteria are sensitive to these acidic conditions. Therefore, the pH should be around pH 4 for the tube incubated at 40 degrees Celsius because this is the best temperature for the optimum growth. 
the pH will be higher and less acidic at the temperatures lower than 40 degrees C as the growth rate is much slower. However, the reaction will still occur. Then finally, the pH should stay at 7 at much higher temperature because these will have killed off the bacteria and caused their enzymes to denature, so we will not get any production of yoghurt. It is important when carrying out tests around the production of yoghurt that the milk is pasteurised to ensure that no other bacteria are present in the milk. Here is an exam question on the production of yoghurt. So we're told it can be produced by adding a starter culture of microorganisms to our milk. This is our bacteria. One of our mixtures was kept at 20 degrees C. That is our solid line here. And the pH is recorded over 10 hours. This is repeated with milk at 40 degrees. This is our dashed line. And then at 60, this is our line here with the graph showing us those results. Using the information in the graph, explain how temperature affects the fermentation process during yoghurt production. I want you to pause the video at this point and attempt this six mark question. So we need to be talking about the data trends, the interpretation and yoghurt production. So the starting pH is 6.8 and the pH reduces to pH 4.5 in 6 hours at 40, in 9 hours at 20 and it doesn't really change at 60. Fermentation therefore is faster at the optimum temperature with the optimum temperature being our 40 degrees. Enzymes will be more active at this optimum temperature, meaning that the activity is higher. However, at the much higher temperature at 60, there is no fermentation or very little fermentation because the bacteria have been killed and the enzymes will have been denatured by this increased temperature. We then need to link this in with yoghurt production, where we've got our lactose in the milk, that's our sugar, that's being converted into our lactic acid. The lactic acid is being produced by bacteria, which was lactobacillus bacteria, if you were going to name it. This reduces the pH due to the production of the acid, which causes the milk to clot, thicken or coagulate into the yoghurt. This concludes this tutorial video from the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In the next video, B3.11, we will move on to look at enzymes and how enzymes can be used in industry.